Since the dawn of time, man has looked to the skies and imagined soaring like a bird. For birds, the act of flying is intrinsic. But for man, the same action is encumbered, fraught with difficulty, and, well, seemingly impossible. Todd Reichert is an engineering student at the University of Toronto. He studies flapping winged flight. As part of his thesis, Todd plans to build a human-powered ornithopter, a plane that flies by flapping its wings. Todd had some early aspirations of flying to visit his, uh, his friends that lived two or three blocks away. And and he had, uh, he had the vision of uh, fly actually flying there with some wings on his, on his arms. Todd is certainly not the first person to imagine this. While Icarus existed in myth alone, many intrepid souls have set their sights on flying like a bird in the sky, under their own power. To date, none have succeeded. So what makes Todd think he can change that? Todd, he's got a drive. It's, it's an obsessive drive for pretty much anything that he's working on. He's a perfectionist. Uh, everything has to be uh, 100%. From the beginning, he knew that this was something that hadn't been done before, and it would be really big and uh, could be really exciting. It would be a huge challenge. Are you willing to make ultimate sacrifices? Not every one of these projects has been successful. A lot of them ended because somebody had a crash and didn't make it. If Todd achieves this dangerous and elusive goal, he will go down in history. We're on our way to uh, Denver for a conference on micro-air vehicles and flapping wings. Uh, in the car, driving across the country and sort of playing around with some of the recent computer simulations that I'd written. Mm. And so we tried, you know, simulating, oh, let's see if we can, you know, what would happen, try to build a human-powered ornithopter, so let's make the wings this big, you know, make it flap, see what happens. Um, and after about an hour, we sort of, yeah, came to the realization that we had something there that, you know, if we can build the, a plane, that is under 100 pounds, that has you know, a wingspan of about 30 meters, and if the wings can move in, in this motion, it will fly. And uh, so knowing that for the first time in history, we, we knew that it was possible. We didn't think that it was possible. We knew we could do it. Right from the get-go, it was a human-powered flapping wing aircraft, and uh, it was pretty fantastical. I thought that Todd, at the very least, would take this further than it ever had been taken before. Uh, the, the papers, the calculations said it was just possible, just barely. Do you want to check it? I have no calculations. Initially having conceived okay. of the idea in 2006, Todd and Cameron spent the next two years mapping out their plans I, I was and beginning the initial phases of development for their aircraft. Much more, you'd get the logo. Ready to put theory into action, they handpicked a team of fellow engineering students and drove from their lab downtown to a glider club north of the city to begin construction. Starting this project, I knew I was going to be sacrificing many other elements of my life for the next four years to dedicate to this. Um, so it's a trade-off.
with a comprehensive task list, including 800 hours of sanding, construction of 25 carbon fiber tubes, 240 circular biscuits, and 102 perfectly shaped wing ribs. Todd and the team have allowed themselves only a finite period of time for building. This means with everything going according to plan, the team will have to work at least 14 hours a day to meet their goals. At this point, we have three and a half months left, and then we need to fly, and we can't take three weeks going down a significantly wrong path. And that's going to be the most difficult part. Everything essentially has to be as close to perfect as physically possible. Through the whole project, we're concerned about weight. Weight is the enemy, and we try to minimize it any way possible. How much difference is that seven grams going to make? Not that much. But once you obsess over something, you do that seven grams a hundred times on all these different components, now all of a sudden you've made a difference. If there's one day where you weren't paying attention to weight and you slopped on extra glue, that glue's never coming off. That component will always be too heavy. So you need to obsess every day. Leonardo da Vinci was this epitome of the Renaissance man. Many people kind of tie him in with the idea of the ornithopter. The ornithopter was one that he had devised that was, you know, he was learning from nature. He was looking at bats. He was looking at how their wings are structured and how their wings move, and he was trying to recreate that. He didn't actually build any models. A lot of the stuff that he sketched, he didn't necessarily build. But uh, he had quite a few different plans for helicopters and, and ornithopters. The knowledge of aerodynamics at the time was essentially zero. You need to travel ridiculously slow. To travel slowly, you have to have a huge wing area, and you have to have a very, very light aircraft. So Da Vinci, uh, Da Vinci's aircraft was simply too small. Yeah, it, it would have to be, I mean, roughly seven or eight times larger. <laughs> When I was a kid, like a high school kid, I built model airplanes. Later on, I met a fellow engineer named Jeremy Harris, and Jerry had a dream of making an ornithopter that could be engine powered and could carry uh, a pilot. And uh, he had done some initial calculations, even built a wind tunnel in his basement. And we thought that this would be a fairly simple thing to address. After all, it hadn't really been seriously looked at for decades. And uh, we had all these powerful tools, you know, our fine engineering educations, our hand calculators, and uh, we, thought, we thought we could take care of this in short order. Well, it turned out we had a tiger by the tail. This was really difficult. The crucial step, besides the calculations and wind tunnel tests, was a quarter-scale, radio-controlled, engine-powered, model that we called Mr. Bill. First time we went out, it splattered itself all along, along the hill. And we knew we had a lot of work ahead of us. Mr. Bill is a character of perpetual ill fortune. Basically, we'd gather up the pieces and figure out what, what went wrong, what could we do next. Each passing year, 
we got a little better. We understood the physics a little better. And we kept ratcheting up the technology until finally, in uh, 1991, September the 4th, High on the success of Mr. Bill, Dr. Delorier and Jerry immediately started working on a full-sized, engine-powered, piloted ornithopter. When the great flapper achieved flight 15 years after Mr. Bill's epic journey, Dr. Delorier had fulfilled his dream. Almost. With an engine-powered ornithopter, you could imagine this having some development potential. Um, Having said that, still, the original dream, this age-old dream of a human-powered ornithopter persisted, and then Todd came along and wanted to come to grips with it. Initially, the team believed that rowing the plane would be the best mode of propelling it. But as they worked to figure out the mechanics of that plan, they realized it would need to be moved with leg strength alone. Next up was to find a pilot. They needed someone with low body weight, the strength and endurance of an Olympic athlete, in combination with an understanding of flight, their project, and a willingness to undertake the potential danger of this endeavor. The idea is just to cut as much weight as possible. We can cut 20% of my weight. I mean, that's 15% of the total weight of the aircraft because the pilot makes up such a huge percentage of the total weight. So the weight that I'll be trying to lose is weight from my arms or visceral fat, the kind of layers of fat that you have in between your organs. To actually fly the ornithopter, Todd will be required to push forward in a rowing motion using only his legs to achieve the desired flapping. So the goal is to be able to produce a leg press of four to 500 pounds. On a typical leg press machine, it's normally at about 45 degree angle, so it'd be like loading that with, with seven or 800 pounds. The power that Todd would have to produce, we would basically look at power curves for, you know, Olympic rowers uh, output, and it's, it's up there. That's why we can only do it for 20 seconds, is because it is a superhuman effort. Otto Lilienthal, a pioneer of human aviation, was born in Germany in 1848. Before his 20th birthday, he had started to study the physical basics of human-powered flight. Over 2,000 experimental glides found him coined the Glider King, and although he never built an ornithopter, he believed flapping flight to be the way of the future. Lilienthal's major contribution was he made successful, repeated, controlled glides. He did a lot of aeronautical testing, like actually, um, you know, building a test wing, putting it on some sort of spinning device so he could get it moving through the air, and measuring the forces on it. He also clearly demonstrated to the world that heavier-than-air flight is possible. He was kind of on the wrong path with regard to the uh, stability and control of his gliders. The control, as far as he was concerned, 
was provided by moving your body around relative to the glider itself, shifting the center of gravity to make it go one way or make it go another. That works OK for small gliders, but if you get toppled by a gust of wind, you don't have the control authority to pull out of it. Otto Lilienthal died the next day from injuries sustained in his accident. Almost three months into their work, and weeks behind schedule. The intensive agenda is becoming difficult to maintain and the workload greater than they had initially anticipated. Todd is still pulling double duty, leading the group and training to be the pilot. I guess five or six weeks before the end of the summer. That's our deadline after that. Uh, some people go back to school, some people are off at, at jobs, essentially, like, that's our window. If we don't hit it, that's it. The other major obstacle is just is the mindset, being able to stay focused enough while maybe not quite sleeping enough, stay motivated. I mean, you're working and living together with the group. You need to be positive. That can sometimes be a challenge. Right now, it's really crunch time. It's really just working late nights and getting out as much stuff as we can done during the week. Um, and then whatever pushes over onto the weekends. I mean, we're trying to do something that's never been done before. We don't expect to be able to do it by working nine to five, so. According to their original schedule, they were supposed to be doing test flights by now. Instead, productivity seems to be slipping, and in its place, tensions rising. When there was the team crisis, I think that was the time where it was like, oh, I don't know if we have the resources we need now to be able to do this. Todd comes up to me, and he, oh, he just looks so beaten down. He looks so sad. And I'm thinking, oh, cow, what happened? Two weeks ago, the somewhat, actually, I think I'm, I think I'm being mic'd here. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk too bad about the team. Uh, we lost a few members of the team. There was five people that quit. It was pretty big shock. It's been really weird. Um, there was sort of like a, a kind of clique within the team and it just started building and they weren't motivated and weren't having fun and it's tough. Like I just dreaded coming in and trying to gather people's spirits. Sometimes you have someone who leaves the team behind, like they are so driven and focused and hard and fast that, you know, this is all there is. Um, and, you know, Todd does that sometimes. He says, Dr. D, the project's over. I guess I, I should have start disassembling things and start tidying up and, and pretty much uh, put an end to it. With two thirds of the team having abandoned the project, Todd and Cameron found themselves adrift. Through an interesting turn of events, things quickly shifted. It was supposed to be a 10-day internship. And then after that, I was supposed to go to Vancouver to do my Math 12 course. This high school student that came out from Vancouver, he just wanted to kind of come out and check it out for a week. Him and his dad are out. Like, this 
high school student builds like model ornithopters in his basement, like, and, and, and the dad does woodworking on like multi-billion dollar yachts. So both of them like know how to build stuff. Okay, what's better for Carson? Stay here and work on the ornithopter the rest of the summer, or go back to Vancouver and do his, his summer school math course. I have nowhere near the math or the physics that they have, so I was picking things up as I was working. At first, I was just building small parts, and then by the end, I was designing the wingtips. They provided, you know, a hell of a lot of time and a hell of a lot of effort and a huge amount of motivation. And the two of them are absolutely unreal. Like, they have basically saved this project by being here. I worked on a lot of projects, a lot of high-profile projects, but the, the type of chemistry that is required on some of these high-paced projects is very important. And I would say during that last month and a half where basically it was Todd, Cameron, Carson, and myself working together, I have yet to have the type of chemistry and good working environment that the four of us shared. It gets pretty intense to try to build a whole aircraft in one summer. We're figuring out ways of not needing as many people, so something that would take three people, we could do with one. So the working it suddenly got very efficient for that last month. And I said, Todd, if you carry on with this, I'll come up and help you too. To make a project like this work, you have to have a good team. You have to have a team that's totally committed. And we were totally committed. We were doing sometimes 15 or 16 hour days, just going home to sleep, eating lunch while we were working, breakfast, dinner, staying until two or three in the morning. Now it's awesome. Like at any given moment, like we are working and I would rather, and I would not want to be doing anything else. Finally, it, this is now, the summer I had dreamed of. Oh, this one's gonna be awesome. As if the rest were not awesome. <laughs> High five. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the wind on it. If you pull it out that door immediately, it just gets taken. It'd be easy to get to let it slip and hit a barn door. I guess it's sort of big. It's the wingspan of a 737, and it weighs just as much as one seat on a 737. Like, it's just seeing something this big is, this is the first time we've been able to really take in the size, and it's just awesome. Like, I love looking at the shape, just looking at how straight the lines are, you know, how much effort has been, been put into making this perfect, and just to see it coming together and everything fitting is, it's beautiful. Huh. Oh. Uh -huh. oh, what a sweet shape. Wow. Yeah. Oh. That's cool. Yves Rousseau, a craftsman by trade, lives in a small town in western France. 
He has always been passionate about flying. De ma plus petite enfance, euh, j'ai toujours, euh, ça m'a toujours fait rêver. À peu près que j'ai appris à voler en 1981, j'ai appris à voler, à faire du vol libre en montagne. Et là, ça a été une grande révélation. Voilà. Il a fallu que je trouve un moyen pour pouvoir voler quand même, parce que la montagne était trop loin. Et c'est là que j'ai mis au point une petite motorisation pour pouvoir être autonome, euh, décoller, faire mon vol, couper le moteur, enfin euh, être dans les, dans les conditions les plus proches du vol libre. Voilà. À force de voler, bah, on est un peu comme un poisson dans l'eau, regardez. Vous voyez, on nage comme un poisson dans l'eau. Yves' desire to experience free flying drove him to look to the birds for inspiration. Pourquoi en, en battant des ailes Pourquoi euh, la propulsion elle est donnée Pourquoi euh, Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour que Comment font ces sacrés oiseaux pour, Comment pour, Pourquoi ils font des milliers de kilomètres toutes ces questions sont venues après grâce à une première expérience. Tout ça, c'est un cheminement. Je vous dis, en tout, ça a duré, euh, ça a duré 25, ans, 25 ans de vol et j'ai eu 13 ans de recherche au niveau du, de la physique des oiseaux. In the early 1990s, guided only by his senses and experience, he set out to build a human-powered ornithopter. Donc, il y avait moi qui y croyais, finalement. Hein. Euh, même, les, même dans les milieux aéronautiques, les, les, les aviateurs. Alors, si jamais on leur dit qu'on travaille sur une aile battante, alors, pff, euh, bon, on se fait passer pour un, pour un fou, quoi, tout simplement. Un fou volant, voilà. <rire> Quand il y a un manque de voler, euh, ça se ressent dans son caractère. Hein, il a besoin de voler pour son équilibre. C'est pourquoi que je trouve bon. De toute façon, je trouve qu'un homme passionné, euh, quelle que soit la passion, c'est toujours très intéressant. Hein. Mais euh, j'aurais préféré que ce soit un pas une passion à moins de risques. Non, il n'y a pas de moteur. C'est à, à pédale. Euh, pédale, à force musculaire. Et ce, qu peut dé... ce que je voulais démontrer, c'est parce qu'avec un moteur, parce qu on peut faire voler n'importe quoi. En tout, j'ai fait 212 vols expérimentaux. 212 vols. Après, il y a eu l'accident qui m'a arrêté parce que je devais progresser. Moi, je voulais faire à peu près un kilomètre en vol plané pour bien démontrer que ça marchait bien. Quoi. Là déjà ça va trop vite puisque je suis déjà plaqué voilà je suis déjà plaqué voilà Et là là fallait que je largue là j'avais le temps j'avais le temps on Eve's 213th flight due to a miscommunication about the speed of the tow vehicle Eve found himself pulled rapidly into the air faster than he had anticipated faster than was safe. With no time to think about releasing his toe, his ornithopter's wings collapsed. The accident resulted in him becoming paraplegic. 
c'est comme la moto, il faut être hyper, hyper... Notre vie, elle est accrochée à... Donc, et, et ce que, ce que j'ai aimé également dans ce sport, quand on décollait en montagne, c'est que tout le monde est solidaire, tout le monde euh, entoure le pilote qui va décoller, euh, vérifier si les câbles sont, si, si on est bien accroché. Si on... Il y a une solidarité parce que le danger, euh, il est, il, et, est, et dominer ce danger, c'est jouissif. Quoi. Enfin, Finally, three months later than they'd originally planned, the team assembled their ornithopter for the first time on a cold October morning. The perfect morning is just dead calm. Being able to get out here before the sun rises, have the aircraft assembled on the runway, ready to go, you know, before we see that sliver of sun. The sun starts to come up, then we got enough light to start testing. The ideal condition was absolutely zero wind. You know, if you could see anything moving, if you could see the trees moving, if you could see a flag moving, then there was way too much wind. With human powered aircraft, you don't fly any higher than you're willing to fall because. The aircraft is essentially, every part is almost about to break at all times. Everything essentially has to be as close to perfect as is physically possible. Uh, if something is, you know, 98%, uh, there's a good chance it's not going to work. We wanted to maximize safety and take every precaution because we have only one Todd and we have only one airplane, and we don't have a lot of resources to fix either. Yeah, so again, the initial acceleration. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can we just pull it way back? The towing it up is okay. something that we basically accepted okay, almost from the very beginning. The biggest problem is always getting it off the ground because basically ornithopters have so many big loads imposed by the flapping wings that if those loads connect to the ground, it shakes the rest of the airplane apart. We're gonna get a toe into the air, and then even if you don't flap, like you'll glide for a certain amount. The thing will be to show that we're not just on an extended glide, that we're actually maintaining level flight uh, for an extended period of time. The distance doesn't have to be exactly, it's not like 50 meters or 100 meters, it's just, you know, it's like the Wright brothers, they're, they'll just do it for some distance. And there definitely was the possibility of getting kited up too high and then something happening and then coming straight down. I would be terrified. <laughs> I think it would be uh, a really scary experience. I'm sure his adrenaline is always pumping like crazy. Having a little glide does not mean that it's going to work. The calculations still said it's borderline. 
that glide. Yes, it meant we can proceed to the next step. We were doing it at that point, but yeah. Focus, we got good wind still. Uh, so the wind is definitely going this way, so let's take it back to that side and do our, all our runs this way. During October, they assembled the ornithopter on a number of mornings. Each time they were able to achieve liftoff. Their glides got longer and they got more confident. But flapping still seemed elusive. And actual flight? Almost an impossibility. Really? That's ridiculous. That's good. Full left hold for five seconds. Full left hold. Yeah, I think we're ready. Everybody ready? Okay. Pull up. came apart at the same time. So, I don't know. It's hard to know what happened first. We're gonna have to figure it out. How you doing, Todd? So something snapped on the first stroke. So I started a second stroke and realized that I didn't have control. I was trying to steer left, wasn't going left at all. And then was trying to pull up for the flare and it wasn't wasn't pulling up at all. So, uh, okay. yeah, so the control was totally out. Okay, so James, I'm going to take this from you and we're going to... Oh. Uh, no, just... Well, the important thing, first of all and foremost, is that Todd is okay. Uh, we're near the end of the flying season, so uh, uh, there's very few days left that could be suitable for testing. So it's tough because we came in today really thinking that we had, you know, a vehicle that could do it. Um, I'm not sure what happened on this. Something's happened. Um, a design flaw that has to be discovered and fixed. But uh, in the meantime, it's kind of a bummer type day. We've just put in hundreds, like thousands of hours and where do you start over? There was basically this massive shudder in the fairing, and I remember thinking, like, how the fuck did the fairing break? Yeah, like, yeah that's, I, I saw the fairing drop. I don't think it's repairable. This is not repairable. With the ornithopter damaged beyond repair and cold weather closing in, the team shut things down for the winter. The Secret of Flight, Program 13, Modern Problems in Flight. Your host is Dr. Alexander Lippisch. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Dr. Come Alexander Lippich was a German aerodynamicist who designed more than 50 aircraft and received more than 50 patents before his death in 1976. That is, you see, a mechanical bra. And 
Well, when you look at it, the basic system of flying is here the same system as the bird has it. The inner part of the wing gives a lift, and the outer part of the wing propels this little aircraft model. Now, I just push one of the connecting rods, and then the wings go up and down. Bearings are all made from small glass beads, so they have practically no friction. You see, now I can let it go, and it flies nicely around like a tame bird. In the 1920s, Lippich attempted to realize sustained flight in a human-powered ornithopter. While there is literature that supports the fact that he achieved powered glides, there is no data and no footage of these attempts, so it's impossible to know for sure. Lippich moved on from flapping flight to become a maverick in aeronautics design and technology. After an uneasy winter of reflection, Todd's interest in his flapping winged machine had not wavered, and his resolve to finish what he started was stronger than ever. He had configured new calculations to address the flaw in his first design, and was ready to put it to the test. Over the fall, we had learned so much more, and Todd's code had changed so much. It very much was a second iteration aircraft. First, we could make the aircraft lighter. Going through a second iteration, there's a lot of things that we had to rush that were heavier. We know where we could cut down weight. I mean, 94 pounds is pretty light for an aircraft, but we can do better. It was, you know, the second coming of what we had conceived, and a lot of further thought had gone into it. When my dad and I came out from Vancouver and we got to Tottenham for the first time in about nine months, we just immediately got back into the rhythm that we had last year. It was like we picked up right from where we left off. We just kept building, testing, like testing individual components, refining everything. We believed uh, Todd's calculations were right. So, I mean, we put a lot of pressure on him. And as he saw the project coming closer to the point, of completion, the margin of errors were just coming together. Like, we were at the brink of the materials uh, breaking. We were at the edge of Todd's endurance. Everything had to work perfectly. A human can only put out so much power, so we want to minimize the amount of power that it takes to fly. And the power required is the weight of the aircraft times the velocity that it's flying at divided by what we call the lift-to-drag ratio uh, times the propulsive efficiency. So to minimize the power, our aircraft needs to be as light as possible. We need to minimize the weight. And we would pay, you know, huge amounts in terms of time or money to find ways to make components lighter. But really, the fastest way, the easiest way, the cheapest way to drop weight from the aircraft is to drop it from the pilot. <laughs> So we're looking at five weeks left, and I am weighing about 172. I'm trying to lose about three or four pounds a week for the next five weeks. The, the trainer that I was working with also devised a diet plan and a workout schedule that would allow me to do that. It was eating incredibly, incredibly healthy, like so many vegetables. I ate so much broccoli, like just pounding hordes of broccoli. I was doing things to boost your metabolism, like, um, you know, fish oil pills, lots of, lots of oils, um, certain types of fatty acids. We were adjusting the airplane to fit Todd's physique. Like, as he was losing weight, we were shifting things on the airplane. He needed to get those 60, 70 grams off the furthest point away from the center of gravity so he could lose another two pounds. 
last night he came to me, he said, or, or this morning, around 4 o'clock when, when we got together, he said, I did it. 156, he got down another two pounds. So what we did yesterday, just the balance was, it was perfect. So over the course of the last month, I dropped about 20 pounds. I weigh one and a half times the weight of the aircraft. Now we're already down a certain path. You know, we've already built the plane to fly like this. There's not really any going back. The calculations show that maybe it'll still work, but it's gonna be really close. Ever hopeful about the possibility of success, Todd felt it important to comprehensively document their flight attempts using a GPS system, video cameras, and other data recording devices. Additionally, he asked Jack Humphreys, a representative from the FAI, the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale, to observe their work in the hopes there would be something exciting to report. Basically, my function was to make sure that nobody's making it up and that the airplane was maintaining its height, maintaining its speed, and the only qualification people could have is it could, might have been a powered glide. We're not gonna go into the wind. Okay, stand by, so what we'll do and it represents probably uh, one of the last great frontiers of aviation. As the prospect of a uh, record flight became more likely, and I think that morning on the 2nd of August, there was a sense of anticipation. just so beautiful and the way it performed with such grace was uh, almost beyond words to describe. I just thank God I lived long enough to see this dream realized. a surreal experience we could run alongside and that was happening it was like usually I don't get tired and I'm getting really tired this is incredible to think you know wow this just went so much further than it ever has before like, we're there wow what the fuck <laughs> If you have a dream and you put your heart into it and you get together with, even if it's a small group, 
You can accomplish anything. Holy crap. How are your legs? Uh, they're sore. Oh, where's my mother? <laughs> Thought you'd be with the airplane. <laughs> Do it. If that's not a sustained fight, I don't know what is. But wait. It's not over yet. Todd and Cameron have set their sights on trying to break the world speed record for a human-powered vehicle on a bike they have designed. And yes, Todd will ride it.